Would you please show us the intro? I'd like to ask you to clap one more time before we get into the topic, and that is to welcome everybody who's tuned in, listening online, live from around the world. And before you do that, I especially want to do a shout out to my friend Angelo and his group of 15 or 18 people in Italy who gather to join us for church on Sunday nights. Would you please welcome our online church. Uh, we, we, we celebrate uh, the incredible amount of things that God is doing in and through our church. Not only do hundreds of people join us live online at, at every service, but my uh, crew tell me that um, since uh, putting our uh, messages out on SoundCloud and making them, them available on podcast, live stream, podcast online, uh, three years ago since we've been in this building, we've reached 100,000 listens which I think is extraordinary. So we began a series uh, today. It's entitled Eden. It's not the first time we've done the series. This is the second time. But this is Eden 2.0. The objective of this conversation is try to answer the question, do you feel your life is blessed or cursed? I know it starts heavy. Can I confess? Can I just make a confession right now? But please, you have to keep it between us. This is a secret. Should I make this is a secret? I like both my children. I like both my children equally. The morning service. Wow, some of you are like, he's got kids. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> some of you are like, okay, here, this confession there. You're tweeting already. Stop tweeting. Donald. So, so it, I, like, I like both my children equally. I like the morning service and I like the evening service. But you are the evening service. There's a little bit something extra, a little bit something extra, got a little bit of extra, just a little bit of extra love, just a little bit of extra love. Let me tell you why. <laughs> let, let, let me tell you why. You don't mind getting to the point quite quickly. Do you understand? Sometimes I can, just, I can just go there, you, you don't hurt me afterwards, and you, you, you still love me, and we can get there, and we can go forward. And this series is going to be one of those series that if you will stay in the lane of what God has in mind over this conversation, it'll rocket your life to the next level and destiny that God has for you. In order for me to lead you into this conversation, you can download the morning message. It's got a lot more of the content, and I've got six or eight weeks to unpack it, but I want to tell you about one or two personal stories or personal experiences that will help you frame what Eden is about. I want to remind you that when God first spoke to man, Adam and Eve, it was to bless them. God's first conversation with mankind was not a command or an instruction, not a disappointment, and certainly not a curse. It was to bless them. That God's very first conversation with mankind was to say, I am making you in my own image. Let us make man in our own image and let us place him in the earth and let us give him dominion over the earth. And God made man according to Genesis chapter 3 and he blessed him. God's plan for you is to bless you. But things go wrong sometimes along the way and along the journey. And the two uh, personal conversations. I, my, my home is under a little bit of construction at the moment. So um, I use that as an excuse to eat my meals um, out. And, but I avoid the, the, too much of the driving through meals because uh, then I must drive through those and go straight to, straight to Virgin Active. But I'm at a restaurant. I'm on my own. And 
I'm enjoying my meal, and there is a couple, uh, two tables from me, and I really do pray to Jesus that you're not here tonight because you're going to be upset with me. But, but the loveliest couple, I actually looked at them and thought, they are so in love. This is amazing. I, one day, me, Lord, and I, I just observed that the way they talked to each other. The chair came out, and the chair came back in. And uh, is that too much? It was just, it was just sweet. It was, everything about it was sweet. They were, I don't know, 12. No, no, they, they were, uh, I think everybody's 12. But they, they, were, they, they were, I don't know, in their 30s, and it was all lovely. And, 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 and then the perfect picture of the glamorous, hope for one day kind of relationship changed when the waitress arrived. Oh, Lord, you see why I like this service so much. You're already there with me. Can I, can, I, can I give you, a, like maybe I'm going to give you a list of advice about dealing with waiters and waitresses. Seriously. Maybe I need to do this on behalf of all waiters and waitresses. They are not there hoping to become your best friend during the next five minutes. They would very much appreciate you to select an order that is at least on the menu. Something they actually make. If you're at a fish place, I don't know, buy fish. Don't ask about spare ribs. Don't get into other stuff. Just ask what's going on. I mean, the conversation took so long. I wanted to interrupt, but, but that, that, and the funniest thing I've ever seen at a restaurant was when some, somebody asked, can you just tell me what's in your chicken stir fry? And the waitress went through everything. It starts out with, I don't know, fried onion, and then they add a jalapeno, and then they, 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 they add, they juliette the thing, and then they, the, the veggies, and then it's these, which veggies? Well, well, we've got carrots, and we've got pumpkins, and we've got, bro and, then, and then the chicken, how much chicken? Two, two chicken breasts. So, wow, that sounds amazing. I'll have a burger. <laughs> okay, but... Anyway, okay, that's just uh, extra advice, just uh, for free, it's for free, that advice. Why the, 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 the thing went, the perfect picture seemed to have gone wrong, was the waitress asked, would you like to place an order? And she said, yes, I will have the salad this with the meat that. And she turned to him and said, and you, sir, and she said, he will have... Yeah, I don't know. I don't know about the. Uh, you can pull out the chair, but you know to pull out his soul. So, so. Okay, wait. What? what? <laughs> okay, order, order. It, it just, it just seemed. It's it, so, so, so. And 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 he. What? What? And then she said he'll 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 have the he'll have the steak and 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 as if one could predict it. It 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 was the. The, 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 the lady's portion, the 250 gram steak, and the waitress said, and how would you like it done? And she said, he will have it medium rare, please. And then she said, he will have it with the vegetables, please. And, and then she said, if you could just bring him an appetizer, please, that would be very nice. And he hasn't spoken yet. I don't know if he hasn't got a voice. I, to this day, he may have a medical condition, I'm not sure. But I suspect that his medical condition is somebody he's married to. And so, and so I'm, I'm just suspecting, I'm suspecting. <laughs> oh, I don't know what goes on in the evening service. They give me too much coffee before the service. And the point is that when you experience something like that, you're forced to ask yourself the question, that question that is seemingly so outdated and yet so true. You ask yourself, who is? And as funny as that story is, part of the whole discussion of Eden is that I have to ask every person in this room, when it comes to your relationship with God, Who is? No clapping for that one. <laughs> Not gonna clap. Just gonna sit there and leave me on the stage by myself. Because that's a critical issue. Who is? Who's who's the who's the guy in charge when it comes to that relationship? And Adam and Eve failed that test. They failed it on so many levels, it's taken almost 40 books of the Bible to get them out of it. The whole Old Testament. God
God gave them the responsibility. And they couldn't agree between themselves who was in charge and found that the snake took over. Whenever you don't agree with God, something else will come and take charge. In every area you are not in agreement with, with God, you will go into agreement with something else. In every area. The second story I want to share with you, and I'm absolutely handling this version of Eden, uh, this first part slightly differently to the morning. So if you'd like to unpack that, I'd encourage you to go and download and listen. But some years ago, I had gone overseas back in the day when uh, I, could, I could go during the school holidays, you know. Um, years ago when I pastored a church of students, then when it was school holiday, then I was almost also on holiday. No longer, of course, because I'd rather be here than uh, be on holiday. But when I'd gone on holiday, I had fallen into uh, a common trap. So perhaps this is also free advice. I had gone to the tourist section of an island. I'm Greek, of course, so Greek island. <laughs> and here's the thing about the tourist section of the Greek islands, of any island, of any tourist section, except in PE. Because we are blessed. But let me just explain to you something that will sort everything out. The paintings are not real. The cologne is fake. And the stuff you buy out on the street is one quarter the price because Chanel is spelt incorrectly. <laughs> it's channel number seven. <clears throat> and the reason that is is because somebody made it in a location other than the original designer. It's a knockoff. And I guess one of the great challenges of the faith is to ensure that we always live in the genuine article of our faith and are not sold a knockoff, thinking we got ourselves a great deal only to find that the content was terrible and there was nothing to it. And I want to spend a little bit of time tonight, as opposed to taking you to the Garden of Eden story, I want to take a few moments, because I've got a couple of minutes with you, and I want to talk to you about the three or four potential, potential enticing, fake versions of Christian authority. The version that I guess the snake sold to Adam and Eve, the version I guess that throughout the Bible, men and women tripped and fell over, the kind that I guess results in people not letting God be in charge. I want to talk you through that a little. In order for me to do that, I've got to take you to Scripture. I'm in Romans chapter 8, and it won't be on the screen. Production, please forgive me. I didn't send you any of this stuff, but it kind of grew and grew in intensity throughout the week. And during worship, I felt like God wanted me to specifically go to this chapter in Scripture with you and talk you through three or four ideas. Romans chapter 8 is well known, and it says, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This is a Bible. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free. Would you nudge your friend next to and say, has set you free? Has set you free. Go nudge the second choice person on the other side of you and say, has set you free. And if that's your husband, you're in so much trouble. The, 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 the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be met, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The first thing I want to point out is that you can determine the strength of your faith, not by the things you do or the intensity of your singing. It is determined by the state of your mind. 
the Bible says that those who are set free by the Spirit have their minds set a certain way. The setting of your mind is one of the most crucial things. Have you ever tried to change somebody's mind that has been set? It's so painful. It's so painful. You can even give them the most logical explanation in the world, but their mind has been set. And take it from me as a pastor, counselor, because I had time to counsel in my earlier days of ministry. There is very little as tough and immovable as a woman's mind that has been set. Now, I'm just going to tell you men. I'm just going to, can I just give you some more free advice? It's an evening of free advice. While she's still arguing with you, you've got a chance. When she stops arguing, all you've got left is a prayer for a miracle. That is all. You see, while she's arguing, she's still considering. Even if she's throwing stuff at you, there's a process of considering because she would not have picked something to throw at you that was of value. So she's still applying her mind. Let me tell you what happens in the counseling room when they stop arguing, when they're like, ah. The cement has hardened and now you need the power of, you know when you sing breaks every chain? <laughs> That's what you need right there. But the truth is, uh, humor aside, the truth is that the nature of man is such that we like to set our minds on things, and then they become really difficult to unset them again and to put them in a new position. Therefore, the scripture goes on to say in Romans chapter 12, we're only in chapter 8 now, it goes on to say in Romans chapter 12, that we must offer ourselves to God as a living sacrifice so that he will, by his spirit, renew our minds, by the transforming of our minds so that we will know what is God's perfect and acceptable will. Sometimes Christians, we have a tendency of looking like strong Christians. We have a look, don't we? We have a way of sounding. We have a way of doing. We like to say bless you before and bless you afterwards and send the high-fiving, praying emoticon. None of that denotes strength of faith. I'll tell you what denotes strength of faith is that you've set your mind on the things of the Spirit. You've determined that your relationship, you've set your mind that your relationship will be run on God's standards. That tells me you are led by the Spirit. That tells me you have a faith that is powerful, not a faith that is powerless. There are a couple of circumstances, a couple of things that I think are necessary for us to be able to understand how to make faith valuable. I don't want to sell you some kind of a cheap knockoff of the real thing. I don't want you to think that you got yourself the best, you know, sometimes the deal of a lifetime is just a trick. And I worry that um, in our pursuit of a faith that is exciting and cool, and it should be, I worry that sometimes in the pursuit of that, we land up with lots of cool and no character, lots of style and no substance, and I want both. Can, can we say amen to that? Someone sent me some message saying, hey, you've got to tell your church that. They've got to stop dressing all fashionably. Church isn't about fashion. No. Please dress fashionably. Please. Please. I don't want people saying those Christians are stuck in the 80s. They think the earth is flat. I want, I, I want, you, I want, you, I want you to move, but, but. Uh, the power of faith is such that put us in any dress code, put us in any room, put us at any party, put us in any situation, in any boardroom, and we are Christ-minded, and our minds are set on the things of the Spirit. It doesn't really matter what the look is. I am in the character of who Christ intends me to be. Can you say amen to that? This uh, passage of Scripture in Romans chapter 8 devotes itself to making sure that we don't fall into the trap of either a fake faith or into the trap of a faith where we're in charge and not God. Those two examples I gave you are the two greatest pitfalls to a faith that doesn't function. Because if you have a faith that is properly done, it functions so powerfully, it'll change everything about your life. 
It'll absolutely transform your life. The only two significant pitfalls that the Bible teaches us about is the pitfall where I hold the control of my faith and therefore God is unable to do what he intends or I never got the real deal. I settled for something inferior. I want to encourage you to be mindful not to fall into that trap. First of all, I want to encourage you to avoid a powerless faith. What I mean by a powerless faith is the kind of faith where you stay the same, but you just add church to your schedule. That is powerless. Amen? I've used this example a hundred times. You know it. You know it so well. You know that there's a, don't ever, I used to say, I used to say, uh, the treadmill doesn't work for me. Well, if, if you're going to get on the treadmill, walk on it, on setting flat at speed 1.1, then the treadmill isn't working. But could it not be because the level at which you are willing to engage, to pursue, is the problem? Is it not possible that I'm using the treadmill um, really more like a casual pavement walk than what it was designed to be. So I made the mistake a few years ago. Some of you know the story. I said to a personal trainer who's a friend of mine, I said, ah, this thing doesn't work. I said, I can do this for hours. He looked over the top. He said, okay. And he pressed the buttons. And he got that thing up to about nine or ten. I didn't even know that was possible. I started seeing demons at about eight. And then he moved over to the speed. He said, how long do you think? Forever. And he pushed that speed up. That thing goes to like 15 or more. I had no idea. It went to double digits at all. He pushed it and he stood back. And then he did the one thing you should never do to a person in that situation. He started chatting. <laughs> I've got no breath to live, let alone respond to your deep question. So how's church? <laughs> <laughs> well... If you're going to operate your Bible at incline 1.1, on speed 1.1, and think it's going to do anything for you at all, then you might be inclined to say, it's powerless. I don't know what the incline should be for you, and I don't know what the speed should be for you. Whatever it is, it should change you. And there is a kind of faith that is powerless, but there is a kind that is powerful. In the book of Titus, there is a powerful scripture just on this point. It says there are some people who have the form of godliness. In other words, it looks right, but it carries no power within it. I don't want for you to have the shape of something. It's okay, Joanne. All right. It's okay. That seemed dramatic. It seemed like the Holy Ghost was... Oh, and another thing. It's okay. You sing so beautifully that you can drop stuff there, do whatever you want. It's all right. I want to encourage you for not a powerless, but a powerful faith. The second thing I want to encourage you on is to be careful not to be sold a pointless faith. A pointless faith is a faith where all the information could be known to you, but you're not planning on using it anyway. Well, that, well that's pointless. Have you ever been in a conversation with someone and you know that they've checked out of the conversation a long time ago? You're just talking to stretch your vocal cords at this point. They're not planning on taking it into consideration. I've done that by mistake on more than one occasion, and I've got to snap myself out of it. I'll tell you another secret, but please don't tell anyone. My good friend um, and I had gone to the Valley Market. I encourage you to go to the Valley Market if you haven't been. It's an incredible thing that we put together is considered one of the top 10 markets in the nation by foodie magazines. You should go, absolutely. <clears throat> to play a joke on me, Luke had gone to the person who sells the banting stuff and said, George is a banter and loves banting food. So far, the joke is okay, because the gentleman recognized me and came with a sample of everything they do. 
incredible banting tarts and banting this and banting that. Now, look, I'm Greek, so I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, <laughs> it's difficult to bant on Monday and then sort of be Italian on Tuesday. So, 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 so there, was a, there was a struggle there. That wasn't the joke. The joke was still okay. The problem was that later that day, I couldn't resist a nice burger. And so for lunch, I had a burger. And the gentleman walked past. <laughs> and then we had that awkward... I went like this. I said, no, Luke, it smells right, eh? <laughs> <laughs> I made him eat it in front of me. Now the guy finds me at every market. I don't go to market anymore. He finds me every market trying to persuade. Uh, my, 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 my point is this on a, a, a pointless fact. Please don't, please don't have all of this possibility of faith and then switch off to it anyway and live something else. There is a greater faith than that. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden were given everything but one thing. You just can't have that one thing. And you know what is so true of human nature? That even if you had everything, you would still be tempted to throw it all away for something else. And I want to encourage you today, don't throw away a good thing in exchange for a fake thing. Don't throw away a good thing in exchange for a faith thing. Let God lead you on it. There is a third kind of caution that Romans chapter 8 uh, a guide encourages or, or guards us against, and that is a passive faith. A passive faith is the kind of faith that though it's true to you and meaningful to you and even powerful in that it has genuinely changed your life, all of that is true. You know the information and it's meaningful to you and you hold to it to be true and you're here tonight and it's sincere and it's genuine and I have respect for you on that. But passive faith is that once you leave this building, would you know to pray a prayer when a prayer is called for? Would you know to find a scripture when a scripture of encouragement is needed? Would you be willing to activate your faith so that the glimpse you see on Sunday will become a tidal wave of life transformation on Monday? Would you know the right thing to say at the right time to know God used me? A passive faith is a faith that's always on the receiving side. But when the opportunity arises to be releasing something, not sure what to do. And I want to encourage you to change that. I want to encourage you to step out in faith. Uh, the staff team and I uh, went on a staff retreat to Jeffreys Bay, of course, because there are surfers on staff. We had a great retreat, uh, conversations about the future, the next year or two. How are we doing on time? I'm on minus one minute. Um, <laughs> there's one minute, 40, minus one minute, 46. Um, a lady approached me um, at a restaurant or a coffee shop, and she said, I want to introduce myself to you. Uh, I was at your service last Sunday. It was my first time. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. And I'll be sure to visit when I'm back in the area. But I noticed her arm was, was in a sling. And this is not me. I like that I, I, I like that you come here and we can do a praying here. But now I'm there, out in the open. <laughs> so I said to you, thank you so much. It would be such an honor for me if I could pray for you. Could I pray for your arm? And she said, it'd be amazing. I said, would you like us to just around the corner? She said, I'll just pray. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like at the checkout area of In Foods. I said, ma'am, no. No problem, maybe just over here. It's just shady here, you know. Just, <laughs> just pray here. Yeah. I looked around for my staff team. <laughs> <laughs> not one of them know about the story because they ran. <laughs> That's not true. I think, Vince, you were there, but you're always there. Well, who was there? Mel. Mel, did you come pray with me? Mel prayed. We prayed for the lady. And she got quite emotional. The following day, I found her again. 
and I, she wasn't in the sling, but that's, I wasn't going to go, yeah, victory, and then injure her some more. Um, I didn't ask about the arm, but she just said, she said this on the second day. I said, I hope you're feeling better. She said, no, I am feeling better. She said, it's not, it's not the arm so much that makes me feel better. It's that I saw you on a stage far away on Sunday. And then I found you the following day. And what you were willing to do then, you are willing to do now. And I can't help wondering, is that a clappable moment? <clears throat> I can't help wondering how many times people are disappointed by our Christianity because it's really shiny in-house, but it's really shy outside. I wonder how many people wonder if when the dancing is over and the songs are done and the haze is off and we walk out of here, are we legit? Or is this another one of them Chanel but actually spelled channel? <laughs> Don't fall for it. And fall for a fake deal. And please don't be in a relationship where you tell God what he'll have for lunch. When he is so powerful <laughs> that we should be saying, Lord, how may I be of service to you? Adam and Eve lost Eden, not because it wasn't beautiful and they thought they could do better. Adam and Eve lost Eden because they used to be in charge and they decided to let a snake wear the pants. The series is devoted to breaking that, putting you in your position as son or daughter of the Most High. God is in heaven, and he's definitively in charge there. Satan can do what he wants in hell. None of us are visiting him there. But here on earth, God has said, I will make man in my image. And we are so in the image of God that just as he is in charge of things out there, he gave us the opportunity to be in charge of things here because responsibility and authority is part of the image of God. And just as he's in charge of things, he put us in charge of something. Will you journey with me on this conversation of Eden to be sure that you activated in your faith to have authority to determine the boundary lines and take care of the Eden that God has called you to. Would you take that journey with me? Would you please stand? Wow, I'm over time. Mer merchandise store, we have a merchandise store. They've actually prepared Eden booklets with pens for notes and notepads. There's some cool stuff there. I, I neglect them because I don't mention them. But please, please pop into the merch space and, and find some stuff there. Can I pray? Can we take a moment to pray. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you so much for the depth of conversation we've been able to have tonight to recognize that you've given us responsibility and opportunity. You've taught us that there is a faith that is so powerful it changes lives. That there is a faith so powerful it sets the future. That there is a faith so significant it changes a heart. And so tonight we pray that we will not fall for anything fake. We pray tonight that we will recognize that if we walk by faith, live according to the Spirit, that we'll be legitimate in our faith. We pray that when we mess up, when we stumble, when we fall, when we embarrass ourselves, we, we pray that we will always be mindful that your grace is sufficient, that you, oh, mercy is on you every day. As we have this conversation concerning Eden, teach us our Eden space. The area 
and space and time and season that you've given us to be responsible for. And then would you empower us with wisdom? Would you empower us with maturity? Will you empower us with godly counsel to have a fruitful faith? I pray over each of us a fruitful faith. Not a fake faith, a fruitful faith. Not a powerless faith, but a powerful faith. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Just while we remain, I know I'm way, I'm five minutes plus over time, but just quick, just a quick response tonight, if your eyes could still be closed, just a quick response to say, I'm not going to take a pointless faith or a fake faith or an illegitimate faith. I want the real deal, and perhaps I haven't had the real deal. I've kept myself at a distance from it because it's been safe to do so, but I'm jumping in, and I'm jumping in with sincerity. I want the real Christ to change my life in a real way, to have a real faith. If that's where you're at, would you quickly raise your hands? Just a quick, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Please pray this prayer with me. It'll be a sentence or two. Would you kindly just repeat these words after me? Everyone in the church, but those who raised your hands especially, but we'll all do it to support you. Would you just pray these words after me? Lord Jesus, I reject every false version of Christianity. My misunderstandings, my ignorance and my sin. Please forgive me. Take charge of my life. I regard you as the king and I the servant. Enter into my heart by the power of your spirit in Jesus' name. And everybody said, would you give God a shout of praise and thanksgiving? If you prayed that prayer and meant it, Please come forward, have a conversation with a counselor, because if you don't have a Bible, we'll give you one. To the rest of you, thank you. God bless you. Have a wonderful evening. Communion in the front, personal prayer right up at the stage. Thank you. God bless.